Just that. 
I still remember the scene quite vividly. I remember that my mom had a heart attack while she was on the sidewalk one day and had to be taken to the hospital. And uh, we happened to be staying at a at my mom and dad's lake home nearby for a time of work and vacation and got summoned in to be there as she was having open heart surgery and very serious moment we almost lost her I remember being there in the waiting room the intensive care waiting room and the doctor coming in and giving us the good news that she had made it through the surgery fine and was going to be okay and as he walked out we were all rejoicing and we were all happy and I began laughing and talking and I believe it was my dad who said, we need to keep it down because the family on the other side of the room was just told their family member did not make it. Life and death, side by side. And every time we think of that cross, oh, what a source of joy for us. Forgiveness of our sin, new life, living in the presence of God for the rest of our days, living with Him throughout all eternity. But oh, what a price was paid for our joy. Oh, what a sacrifice made that we might live. And that sobering reminder of the price that Jesus paid is always a good thing to remember as we celebrate the cross because we have our turn on the cross if all the peoples of the world are going to hear about Jesus. There is no comfortable way to spread the gospel across the world. And there is no painless way to take the gospel to people who have not heard it, who do not want to hear it, who could care less about it. So it is our destiny. It is our calling. It is our responsibility to hold together in our hearts the joy of what that cross accomplished along with the suffering that it took for that joy to come. And he is healthiest as a believer who keeps in his heart each day both the joy and the cost, the fruit and the responsibility. Oh, the wonderful cross. Dr. Craig Price, would you please come and join me here on the platform? Dr. Price is our Dean of Students. He is also a professor of New Testament and Greek, loves his Greek New Testament, loves to show students how to take that Greek New Testament and find in it sermons and be able to teach it accurately to your teachers and expound the Scripture from the Word of God. Would you please come and lead us in a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful. This day we are reminded of the sacrifice that you made on the cross for each one of us and father you allowed your son to endure the shame and go through that suffering because of your great love for us thank you this day lord that that you do love us and because of that love we we've been called in that love to share it around the world and i thank you for these students for the calling you've placed upon their lives and uh, Father, just burn it in our hearts today how much we have to be thankful for in, in what you did through your son Jesus. And Father, we thank you for uh, Dr. Eden as he comes today to, to bring a message on his heart. Lord, fill him with your spirit. Speak to us. We need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them both weep and rejoice for what Jesus did. Would you do that? Weep and rejoice. Thank you so very much. We welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. It is our delight to have today one of our new faculty members and a member of our uh, educational administrative team, and that is Dr. Michael Edens. He and I were in seminary together, although, as you can see, he was far older and wiser than I was. I came in as a pipsqueak, and he was one of those mature students everybody looked up to who was filled with wisdom and knowledge. Uh, Michael Edens has spent his life on the international mission field, has immersed himself in the Islamic world, the Middle East, 
and the parts of the world that we would consider hostile ground for Christianity. And he and his wife have invested themselves literally all over that Middle Eastern region, and they have gone to the very intellectual center uh, of the Islamic faith and the Islamic world, engaged its scholars in dialogue, and been there uh, representing Christ at the place where they most teach the teachings of Islam. And they have been all sorts of places doing all sorts of things that many people would just say, there's no way in the world I would ever have the courage to do that. Well, Mike and Madeline Edens learned that the word for courage is obedience. And it's a funny thing, we always have the courage to do the things that God wants us to do. And when you focus on the obedience, the courage comes. It is just a great honor for us to have Mike, his wife Madeline, is here with us today. We welcome you, Madeline, to have them back in New Orleans. And to they're out living in uh, one of our neighborhoods in New Orleans near the French Quarter. Uh, they're in for an interesting couple of weeks as Mardi Gras is about to get underway. Uh, and then to have them also on our teaching team and as our associate dean of the graduate faculty. One of the things that he's going to be adding to our curriculum I think you will be very interested in, and that is we hope to begin next year uh, a program of Islamic studies and really offering uh, some more training for our students who are interested in the Islamic world and in how we represent Christ to those who come from strongly held belief systems such as that of Islam. Whether you realize it or not, uh, you don't have to go to the Islamic world to have an opportunity to witness to followers of Islam. Uh, I know now even in our smallest towns, uh, I often find an Islamic community many times owning a hotel uh, or a restaurant there, and it's just amazing how God has brought the whole world, not just to our cities, our great big cities. He's brought the whole world even to the smallest towns of the United States, and learning how to bear witness is so very important. Let me take just an additional moment to say a word about Mardi Gras. It is about to begin. Uh, Mardi Gras is not just a day for those of you who have never been in New Orleans before during this time of year. Uh, it is a 10-day process. It starts officially on Friday, and it goes through a week from next Tuesday. That Tuesday itself is Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, uh, immediately before Ash Wednesday. The simple guide to what Mardi Gras is all about for those who really believe it passionately is go out and live it up during Mardi Gras so that you can give it up on Ash Wednesday. Uh, it is a very big deal here in New Orleans, a very, very big deal. And people take it extremely seriously. It does present us as Christians some excellent opportunities to witness. The Mardi Gras includes traditions that we can use. For instance, a king cake. You're starting to see at your grocery stores and other places something called a king cake. If you have children in school, they may have come home and told you you have to take a king cake to school on Friday. Well, that's a cake that is named because it has the three colors of Mardi Gras, green and purple and gold, which represent the gifts of the Magi, the wise men, to the baby Jesus. And inside the king cake is a plastic baby representing the baby Jesus. Please do not chew and swallow the baby Jesus when you have king cake. <laughs> Many people in New Orleans do not even know that's where the king cake tradition comes from. And it gives you an opportunity to use the king cake to talk about the colors representing the gifts that the Magi brought to the baby Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done. Uh, I want to tell you two things about, uh, three things about the parades. Number one. Wherever parades are, it's illegal parking, and it doesn't matter if there's a sign there to tell you that or not. Every Mardi Gras parade is preceded by a fleet of about 30 tow trucks. They will tow your car, and if you have two or $300 you don't need, you can go down and pick it back up uh, after the parade. So be very careful about where you park during Mardi Gras. Number two, the French Quarter and downtown uh, on the weekends in particular, this weekend and then next weekend and from next weekend all the way through Tuesday, is a combat zone. And you do not need to go down at all to the downtown area or the French Quarter unless you are going down there to share your faith in Jesus Christ and you do not go alone. You take some friends with you. It is an extremely intense place, the magnitude of which I could not begin to communicate to you. So the general rule is don't go down to the French Quarter or downtown during the Mardi Gras time unless you are going as a witness for Christ and you are going with some friends and you know you are going to be 
under unbelievable pressure and intense attack every time you open your mouth about Jesus. So be very, very careful about going downtown. However, the parades in the neighborhoods uh, in Jefferson Parish and on St. Charles, the upper parts of St. Charles, are not anything like that at all. They're much more family-oriented. And again, you have a great opportunity to witness because the people in New Orleans love to talk. They love to talk and there's a lot of delays between parades or sometimes between floats and you can have an opportunity to tell people about Jesus and again use some aspects of Mardi Gras and the fact that it precedes a day of repentance uh, which is what Ash Wednesday is all about. You can use these things as a witnessing opportunity should you choose to do so. But we really don't have any say in the matter. The city of New Orleans is going to have Mardi Gras, whether we vote for it or not. Uh, and it will disrupt all of our lives. Traffic patterns change. They have to move floats from one side of town to the other. Traffic stops at odd hours. Uh, it's just an interesting 10-day period. So let's get ready for it. This is our last chapel service. Before it begins, I always take a few moments to say something about it. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask one of your professors. Ask me if you would like any further information about Mardi Gras. Every day in the daily paper, they publish the parade routes for the day. Mardi Gras is not nearly as big yet as it was before Katrina, but it's beginning to get there. So do pay attention to the parade routes and know what's going on around you. And most of all, if you have an opportunity, use it to bear witness to Jesus. Let's turn our hearts to worship and praise. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. They have rebelled against you. But... Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. Let those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as a shield. So let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing for joy. Let's stand and joyously sing together this morning.
silent. My Jesus, I this time of worship as we hear from your word and don't let us be the same uh, as we walk in here this morning i pray that you would just have your have your will in this service it's in your name we pray amen it's a joy to be here to uh wrap up this new kids on the block week uh we started off you know we could do previously in chapel uh, we started off looking at the cross on uh, Tuesday and uh, then looking at the love we should have and do have for the church because we're church men and church women. We're not about just an education. We're about leading the church. And today I want to turn and look in those final hours of the ministry of Jesus to his disciples at some words in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. As Jesus is talking to us about abiding, about living in his love, and living in obedience, and living in joy. I come to you uh, with joy. But I don't come alone. 
this morning as I stand before you and think about what we need, the youngest of us, and I guess the oldest of us, <laughs> and all of us, what we need to be faithful disciples. As I come in that way, I come with friends. Madeline and I, and I have been blessed to work in the Muslim world for the last 27 years. And usually the illustrations I would bring would be of Muslim background believers. People who left Islam and left the strong social pressure of the Muslim world in order to claim Christ and to walk in faith as a disciple. But this morning, the illustrations I will use of life do not come from Muslim background believers. They come from ten who have gone before us. We see in the last uh, four years, ten of our colleagues died in the Middle East. Some, their life ended because of a bullet from an anarchist, a murderer, an assassin, a terrorist, a Muslim. Some died by illness. Their life was cut short as we count it, but they were taken from us. And some died in accidents. Janessa was returning from uh, visiting the people she loved, the nomadic people. And she was on a bus, and, and late at night, driving through the night, the bus hit a truck, and Janessa died. But I come with these, and I will challenge you with them, not because they died, for we're all going to die, but because they lived. They lived in Christ. And they would take the, this passage and share it with you and me as we seek to live in him. Look with me. John chapter 15, verse 9. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Brief words, important words. The love, the gift love that Jesus talks about between him and the Father that high, exalted love which existed before all creation, when God, Father, Son, and Spirit lived in a community of love, united in a deep relational love that is unique within the person of God. We talk about relational love and we talk about, we talk about persons as if we know what that means, but it's only seen in God. The pure relationship of, of the Godhead is, is where relationship is. The person of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is what a real person is. All of the rest of us are just shadows. And so the love between them, the love between the Father and Son, is love. Everything else seeks to be love. The Bible is clear in that in using the word agape for this love. But yet it brings that agape love to us and it says that love is the love that the Father and the Son both love you with and love me with. Jesus says in the same as the same example, in the same way, in the same strength, in the same intensity that the Father loves me, I love you. And he's getting ready to show that in the cross. But he doesn't use it in the future tense. He uses it in the past tense. 
And it's important for us to notice that. Peter could have been thinking, ah, you love me. You loved me when you told me, get behind me. You loved me when you reached out and grabbed me as I was sinking in the wave. You loved me when you sort of chuckled at my desiring to be a leader and coached me along. The love of Jesus for his disciples was not questioned by them. None of them said, but Lord, when did you love us? They had experienced his love in deep ways. It had transformed their life, every one of them. And now after Judas has gone out and after they've partaken of the supper and after he's talked about the pruning of the father of the true vine, he says, I loved you. Abide in my love. And so as you and I prepare for ministry and as we minister, as we think of this city in transformation, not just transition, it's important for us to realize that Jesus is, is brooding over this city. The Spirit of God is brooding over this city. The Father is brooding over this city. And they are saying, I have loved this city and I would love it now through you. As we sit in classes and as we pray together and as we study God's word together, it is important for us to recognize that the wounded churches of New Orleans and of this great Gulf Coast are going to rise again because of the love of God that must stretch out across this land and must fill broken hearts with hope again. But you know, the love that Jesus talks about between the Father and Son is not just a passive, comfortable kind of love. For Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. The cross is directly in front of him. Judas has already gone out to betray him. All of the disciples are wondering if they're going to stand by him, and in fact, they fall away from him. The love of God for the, the Father, for the Son, was a love that was willing for him to suffer unmeasurable loss for our redemption. So when Jesus says, I have loved you with this same love, he is not talking about a mushy, feel-good kind of love. He's talking about a love that will send us into hard places. Gene and Larry had spent 25 years in some of the hardest places of Central America. They had a name that was renowned in the world. They were at the top of their game. And Larry got a call that water expertise was needed in a war-torn war place, and he went. Because that's what you do when you're a follower of Christ. You go in obedience. And Larry went into that place and it was hot and it was dirty and, and there was difficulty. And, and yet, as I read his reports, as I read his response, every time he turned around, he saw God calling him there. Calling him from being the expert and the leader and the the acknowledged professional to go and work in a place where there was no acknowledgement. And so I began to talk to his wife, Jean, and say, well, you know, Jean, you've got a lot going on there. What is God saying to you? I know what God's saying to Larry. What is God saying to you? Well, you have to know this about Jean. It was dangerous to know Jean. Jean loved people. And she was not a little, you know, petite woman. She was a woman with some power with her because she had done hard work all of her life. And so when Jean greeted you, it was with a bear hug. And I'm not talking about a little kind bear hug. It was a bear hug. 
And Jean looked at me and she grabbed my hand as we sat in my office praying in Richmond. And she said, Mike, I must go because Jesus' love must be known. People judge ministries in all sorts of ways. One of the most common ways is to judge them by duration. If you were to judge Gene and Larry by duration of their ministry in that place God called them to, you would say they were failures. But another way to judge ministry is by the impact of love. Everywhere they went in the few weeks that they were in that country, I met people who said they were so lovely. And I experienced their love in such a deep way. I want to know more. That's what Jesus is saying. As the Father has loved me, I am loving you. As the Father sent me to love a world that was broken and lost and hopeless and to bring transforming love to it, I am loving you that way. And trust me, you need not go to the Middle East or to go overseas if you're looking for a place where love like that is needed. Just lift up your eyes and look. The fields are white for the harvest. But there are voices around us that say, oh, well, I don't know if you're really able. I don't know if you're capable of this. One of the things I do to keep uh, uh, alive at my advanced age is uh, to run, and I run with an MP3 player, and, uh, and Casting Crowns is one of the groups I, I run to. And one of the first songs I listen to each morning as I run, well, I don't run every morning, I should, but I, I don't. Um, one of the first songs I listen to is Voice of Truth. Folks, brothers and sisters, of all the voices calling out to you, listen to Jesus. He's saying, I love you. You're mine. And discount those other voices. Abide in his, in his love. Abide in him. Gene and, and Larry learned that a long time ago. May we learn it well. But Jesus says, if you're going to abide in me, you will keep my commandments. As I have kept the Father's commandments. You would think that if he's going to say that somewhere in this discourse, he would summarize the Father's commandments. And in fact, I believe he does in John chapter 17 as he's praying. As he's reporting back to the Father, Jesus says this, beginning with the, the first verse of 17. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And he goes on to talk about keeping the disciples that God had given him. He talks about giving them the word of truth. Those are the commandments that Jesus had. Go and make a band of disciples. Go and touch a world and create the means for that world to come back to God. And here at the end of his ministry, as he's preparing to go to the cross, he said, I have kept the commandments of my Father. Keep my commandments. Islam, among the Muslims among whom I've lived, have a lot of rules. 
Jews have a lot of rules. All the religions of the world have a lot of rules. Christianity has a few rules. Now, we realize that as Christians in churches, we have a lot of rules. But Jesus has just a few commandments for us. The first and greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. On this, he says, all the commandments and all of the prophets stand. I haven't fulfilled that. I don't know anyone who has. But it's surely simple, isn't it? It's surely straightforward. What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? It, cer it certainly means that in Mardi Gras season, I should be ready to give a witness to who Jesus is to people who have not experienced him. It certainly means that I should be ready to recognize that someone who's down and out or culturally less adva advantaged than I am, that they have a right to know who Jesus is just like I do. And we could go on. It certainly means that I should be a witness and I should be a disciple everywhere I go. I should be a brother to brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. And I should be faithful to put their needs above my needs. That's what it means. But what does it really mean to love the Lord your God with all your mind and heart and soul? The five core values of this seminary gives us a pretty good idea of how to be really committed to excellence and discipleship and ministry and focus on God. It is not just a spiritual or intellectual or even just a physical exercise. Loving God is full worship. It takes all of us, all of our time. We have holy days, but we have a, a full week to give worship in. We have hours of praise, but our whole life is to give him praise and honor. Paul said that we are to offer our lives as a living sacrifice to him. Maybe that captures it best. Today, what would it mean? Seriously, what would it mean if New Orleans experienced we who are in this room actually being accountable to each other to love God with all of our heart and mind and soul and our neighbors as ourselves. One thing we learned in the Muslim world, it doesn't take great crowds to impact a culture or a city. There's a little town in the mountains of Yemen and in this town, Dr. James Young, in the early 50s, received a license, a permission to build a hospital. And for these 50 plus years, there has been a Christian witness in that place. One of the men who was prominent in that witness, his name was Bill. Bill was a grocery store manager in Kansas City, Missouri. And God called him to go and share the gospel. And he said, what do I have to give? What do I have? And he looked at all the opportunities and there was this job to be the administrator of this hospital, to go and take care of, of the stores and the, and the logistics of this healing institution. And Bill said, I can do that. Bill went to that place and he planted his life. Every Christmas season, he would make wooden toys for the orphans in the orphanages around there. Every week, he would go to the prisons and minister in the name of Christ to people who the whole society had turned their back on. Weeks and months would go by when there was limited finances and they would, they would have to 
limit themselves to the medical care that they could they could get paid for. And so Bill would take up money from family and friends to meet drug needs of the crucially, the critically ill people. People knew in the neighborhood that Bill cared for them. One day as Bill was about his work, a man who was enraged because Dr. Martha had in, had dared to share the gospel with his wife, came onto that hospital compound and came into a room where Kathy and Martha and Bill were meeting. And with his AK-47, he expressed the hate he had for them. But Bill got the last word. In his handwritten will, he said, Please, should I die, let my body remain in Yemen. For God loves Yemen. And I have experienced his love for the Yemenis. And I want my body to stay where my heart is. He had experienced the command to go and to love and witness. He had lived it out with all that he had. But in death, he did not want his body to go back to the States and be buried in a cemetery. He wanted to get the last word in. Today, if you go to that small hospital, enter through the gate, wander around behind the administrative buildings and the surgical wing and the maintenance shop and go up to the edge of the hill, you'll find a tomb, a grave. And the inscription says Bill and his last name. Died such and so in love. And it says some other things that I won't say. Being obedient to the command of Jesus gives us opportunity to abide, abide in him as Bill did. The last thing Jesus says is, abide in me and let my joy be in you. And here I'm talking about death, and you're saying, death and joy, how does that fit together? Well, it does. It does fit together. Mercy Me, the lead, lead singer of Mercy Me had lost his, his uh, dad in 1991. In 99, he, he wrote that song, I Can Only Imagine. As he thought about his Christian faith and thought about what his dad went through when he was ushered into the presence of God. And there is this reality that abiding in Jesus, being faithful in his love and being faithful in his commands, being faithful as his witness, gives us joy here and great joy there. We get to experience his joy the scriptures do say that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So Jesus is going through to the cross with a recognition that should he finish the course, great joy was going to be his and everyone who would trust in him. One of the ladies who died in Mosul in 2004 was Karen. Karen was a police officer. I used to work with Louisiana State Police as a chaplain, and, and I have a special place in my heart for policemen, even in OPD. It's, I'm working on it. And um, Karen was a police officer, 
officer, a sheriff's deputy in California. And God called her to go to mission, on mission trips, and she went and came back to her job, and she would leave, and uh, they would, they, she would have to resign her job because uh, she'd be gone for two or three or four months and come back. And, and then God called her to go and be his presence in that war-torn country. She was getting ready to go back in from Jordan for the trip that was her final trip. And I noticed that as we were praying together in Amman, Jordan, that she had a band on her wedding finger. And I said, Karen, what, what's with the band? Because she was single. She said, oh, I, I, you know, people said for a long time one way to take care of the, the harassment of of Muslim men is to get a wedding band. I said, yeah, they've been saying that for a long time, but you never had a wedding band. She said, yeah, you're right. She said, I was in the market the other day, and I just thought, I am married. I am married. Because I love Jesus. I love him so completely. And so I bought a wedding band. Her joy was full because his joy resides in her. This morning, you and I need to take courage from these men and women and from Jesus. We need to abide in the love that doesn't stop at hard obstacles. We need not to flinch at the simple command to love him with all our, our heart, mind, and soul and obey him and treat our neighbors as ourselves. And we really need to let his joy flow. The world is waiting. This city is waiting for such as you to walk in that simple way. I'd like to pray for you. Father, with the love that you sent the Son into the world and loved him through the completion of his task and rejoiced with him as you welcomed him home, we ask you to empower us. We ask your Spirit to guide us to all truth through the truth of your word in our hands that we might be obedient to your commands. And Lord, we pray that your joy might flow through us, the body of Christ, in such a living way that the world might experience you in our fellowship. Thank you for this body of believers. Thank you for the churches we cling to. Thank you for the privilege of walking with you. In Jesus' name we pray.